so uh, this week the party just refused to listen to anything the DM had to say. Like every time he was trying to explain what the inside of a room looked like or how the cursed idol was definitely super totally cursed. The party just kept like cutting him off and then trying to interact with that thing. And then people kept dying. And eventually the DM just started strangling the rogue player. Uh, it was deeply funny, but uh, as you could probably assume, sessions canceled. Oh, no. All right. No snappy chopping. All right. Well, I, I, I didn't. I, I had nothing. I, I will be honest. I had nothing on that one. <laughs> you're slacking. You're slacking. That's what you're doing. I, yeah. It do be that way sometimes. Okay. Brother, brother, please. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. Was I supposed to come in and save you there? Uh, no, not save me. Usually you just like I come up with a weird cold open and then you have a comment about how unhinged it is. I was just expecting it this time. Always expect the other. I apparently, apparently. <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome back, everybody, to yet another episode of the Sessions Cancel Podcast. It's me, Isaiah. I'm here with Josh. I'm not here. Damn, that's crazy. Well, I guess it's going to be me today then. Uh, yep. Where we, dear listeners, are going to be picking up episode two of our. I, I named this something else. God damn it. <laughs> It, the document did, is called something else. But are you, you doing an episode two? Yeah, it, I called it uh, GM Help Hotline versus what its actual name is, is DMs Anonymous, where we take uh, the burning questions and problems <laughs> of DMs across the interwebs and try this, to help them figure that shit out. This feels like a, a Joker situation. The backstory is whatever I want it to be. <laughs> yeah, I'm fair enough. Uh, now, as you may not remember, uh, listeners, Ed, Josh... We got a couple couple of rules when it comes to good old DMs Anonymous. Uh, rule one is you can't say just don't. We have to try to actually solve these people's problems uh -huh, the best of right, our ability right, right. without without saying either just don't or play a different game. Basically, right, we can't right. be Reddit commenters. Right, 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 right. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, I've got. I've got ten doozies. Um, uh -huh. It's gonna be quick, several you, hours. I'm 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 excited. These are, you always find some some interesting sows. I yeah. Look, <laughs> there's, a, there's gonna be a lot of reading this episode. Like okay. some of them were really fucking long, but there I was like, oh, this actually is quite interesting. Okay. So uh, we're <sighs> not doing the wheel this time because frankly, I just got off of work and I'm fucking exhausted, and the wheel doesn't save anymore on my computer. For some fucking reason, gotta find um, a new, gotta find a new uh, wheel program. I, yeah, I'm gonna have to. Uh, while I pull up the list, Josh, tell the people what they need to know. Hit the follow button, or I'll eat your cat. I shouldn't have said Why that. Th I shouldn't have said that. Why did you? Yeah, I should, what the I, fuck is wrong I, with I you? I just okay. I want to be really, really clear for anyone who understands the political implications of that statement. I wasn't intending for that to be a reference to our yeah. current political climate in America. Uh -huh. That was not intentional. I just Dog. said something <laughs> off the dome. I'm sorry. I'm not uh, trying no. to be racist. I swear to God. <laughs> that was that. Is that's probably the closest we're gonna get to canceled. I so genuinely did not mean to reference Orange Man Bad. I didn't mean to. I <laughs> that is crazy. Actually, no, that's not true. I re-listened to our uh oh, our, like our racist 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 episode. Uh-huh. And I definitely miss I misspoke really bad during that episode. To be uh -huh. fair, I was fucking exhausted. I could I could hear it in my own voice. Where I was like Bioessentialism is good, actually. And I mean, looking back, I was like, why did you word it like that? Are you fucking stupid? That is not what I meant. Oh, I did just, I was God. literally smacking my head into my fucking desk. Like, what is wrong oh. with me? Why did I choose those words in that fucking <coughs> order? You dunce. <coughs> um, oh, my God. I was so mad. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, no, I did not mean that. I just hit just hit subscribe, please. Let's just pretend like I didn't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I so deeply was not trying to break. I really, really, that was so deeply not intended. I, dude, you, okay. I need you to understand my play by uh, play in my brain space. I'm yeah. pulling up the list and you're like, do it or I'll eat your cat. And I was like, damn, that's great. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. 
I this is that was really that was one of those things where like the thing you've been hearing about subconsciously just leaked into the back of your mind <laughs> situation. Yeah, no, that is that is like the most Freudian oh, of slips. Oh, yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, I Orange Man bad. Just so we're clear, Orange Man bad. <laughs> yeah, Orange Man bad. We can agree. Yeah. Oh my god. Fuck the living Dorito dust. <laughs> Dorito dust. Yeah, it looks like he got smacked in the like someone with a really like greasy Dorito <laughs> dust no, covered no, hand I, smacked I, in no, the face. I get exactly what you meant. <laughs> I knew. I knew what you meant. <laughs> it, it looks like uh, someone smashed up a bag of cheese doodles, like cheese doodles and puffs, like puffed it, and like, like and just like walked up and smacked it, it as face. hard as it could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, oh my please goodness! Please take us away from this. <laughs> okay, don't worry. We're I, actually I we have so much reading to do that it's good that we're starting soon because there's a lot. Um, right. So we will take turns uh, reading take these. Turns reading. I've just oh. decided this now. Okay. Because there's okay. so much to read, I don't want to do okay. it all alone because I'm gonna fuck it up. I'm exhausted. But I will start things off with uh, question number one, uh, as uh-huh. given to us by uh, good old Reddit. Question. Do your players listen to room descriptions? Description. Mine don't at all. As soon as I mention something they can interact with, they start telling me what they are doing. One time I said there was a body on the floor, and a player rushed in, refusing to listen to any more. I told him twice he needed to let me finish. So I gave the big monster standing over the body a free hit. That slowed him a tiny bit for the next room, but only a bit. Descriptions of scenery, surroundings, travel montage, and weather, forget it. They just don't care at all. Funnily enough, they will listen to box text in case as cl- in case it has clues. Descriptions of scenery, surroundings, attra- uh, well, why did that no, you just, yeah, you just person just that. doubled up? No, you yeah. doubled up. No, I, that's I'm. Oh, did I? I'm an idiot. I think you well, doubled it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, what about your yeah, players? So this one's a little. The last bit was what about your players? Are they interested in atmosphere? Do they let do they let you finish your sentence? Uh, if it starts with UCA dot dot dot, that was the last chunk. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, we're starting off pretty basic with this one. I chose it because it was pretty simple. Uh, what do? How do you? How do you get your players to do this? Okay, I, I feel like we need to add a, a third caveat rule, which is we can't just say talk to your players and then move on because that's just always going to be the yes. answer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, to be a little more specific, then. To tell your players to stop being fuckheads. Um, I, I, so the th- the thing that immediately jumped out at me here is that they said, funnily enough, they will listen to box text in case it has clues. And I assume what he means by that is if you're running an official adventure, they will listen to the box text from the official adventure. And... The idea that your players are willing to listen to the box text from your official adventure, but not willing to listen to what is effectively your custom box text for your own homebrew stuff is like, I I don't, I I don't, I don't understand what, how to square that. Like what, what the fuck is the, it's the same thing. Are your players retarded? Like, are your players dumb? <laughs> like, I don't understand. Mm, I, I, nice safe. Nice yeah, safe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, like, I, uh, you see what I mean? Like, that's that's really strange, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sort of of two opinions on this one. The, the first one is just be bad cop for a while. Just continuously punish the players with, you know, slightly... Or, you know, uh, uh, slowly increasing uh, danger until one of them just gets like instead. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if they just mm-hmm. get frame one clapped by a disintegrate, if he dies, he dies. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, show them that maybe this isn't the best idea and they really need to rethink things or they're going to get fucked. Um, inversely, you can punish them or not punish them, but you can sort of no, I mean, punish them. You're willing to punish them for bad behavior. So, yeah, that's fair. Well, you could you um, could you could take a carrot approach here, and if they take the time to listen, reward them with 
valuable information, potentially. Right? Like, you yeah, could- yeah, of course. Like, reward them for sure. Uh, but, like, in the immediate, to get them to stop, you know, use the stick a little bit. Right. Until they, they stop. Uh, this this is like this has little you know it's a little Pavlovian right like you know you push the dog's nose in their own shit until they stop shitting on the carpet and then when they're they've like neutraled out then you can sort of help train them to do the other thing correctly right I think the uh, argument is that that doesn't work very well maybe yeah I mean that's fair. I, I mean, particularly when we talk about like training animals, negative reinforcement doesn't seem to work as well as positive. Um, I suppose, yeah. But like, there's a. Go on. Well, so my immediate thought I, is, I would I would ask the players, why do you listen to to box text but not listen to me if I'm giving like a descriptor of the room you know what I mean like that would be question number one because like what the fuck is the different like like you as players what is the perceived difference right because something based on how this person worded it they're they're perceiving these two scenarios as different even though they're arguably the same scenario right Mm -hmm. so I would ask that would be my first question and then yeah I mean having the big monster smack him in the mouth (laughs) or like investigating the body immediately that's not an unreasonable reaction I think I think what I would try and do is say to the players All right, so, like, you guys have been having this habit of, like, I'm describing something and you just immediately try to jump in. You can keep doing that if you really want, but if you don't, there may be something worthwhile. And then I would, if they listen and take the time to not just immediately jump in, I would reward them with some, like, potential information. Like, for example, you scan the room... You know, there's a monster at the far end. There's some torches, yada, yada. There's a lever on the western side of the room uh, that seems sort of like, you know, that seems like it's attached to some sort of like trap mechanism. And then if the players let you finish the whole description, now they know, okay, there's this trap mechanism. Maybe we can leverage that in the fight. Something along those lines. And if they simply choose to basically what you do is you do Schrodinger's lever. If they don't let you finish the description, the lever does not exist. <laughs> if they do let you finish the description, then the lever exists and they can use it. That would be kind of the angle I would take with it. Interesting. Okay. I like that. For me, I feel like where my brain immediately goes to, other than just like punish them, um, is kind of reverse psychology them, you know, give them because it says here, right, the, the the OP wants to, like, front load the descriptions with all the relevant information, then gives them all the flavor text around that, right? Right. I feel like you're probably better off explaining everything to them and then slowly, you know, dropping little nuggets of plot important stuff into it. You know what I mean? So, like, rather than, you know, you you give them the description of the room, you give them the blood all over the walls, and at the end you go, and and then your eyes focus on a body in the center. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a similar thing to what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... I mean, yes, you... I mean, realistically, you can do both, right? You can give them everything, and then... If they jump in while you're just describing the room, then it is, in fact, an empty room, and then you'll just put a room behind that room with the actual stuff in it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you could definitely go with that angle. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, pretty pretty simple one. Like, 
this is also kind of a mild problem. Like it's annoying, but also at a certain time you just kind of, you know, it's kind of like whatever, I guess if this is what they're going to do, then this is what they're going to do. You know? Yeah. That's why usually I'm, I'm someone who's like, don't punish your players, but this is one of the ones where I'm like, now nah, they'll be fine. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, well, because the punishment here would be pretty minute light stuff. Like, you're, this isn't the kind of thing where you'd be punishing them. It's not like you're destroying the game. You're just letting them get smacked in the face or they're not noticing a thing or whatever. It's not that. Like, yeah, it's not that detrimental that you're going to ruin the game for them. And also from a from a sort of verisimilitude co- uh, like uh, angle, because I'm always bringing up the concept of verisimilitude. If the players or if the if the characters, at, at, you know, as decided by the players rush into things with reckless abandon, then it makes sense that they would get smacked in the face more often. So they're probably not going to be that mad about it because if you just run into a room without looking around in an area that you know is dangerous and then a monster punches you in the mouth, you're probably going to go, well, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. I did just rush into the room with no, you know, with reckless abandon. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it, it doesn't it doesn't break that internal logic. So it doesn't feel particularly cheap either. I mean, there's ways you could do it that will feel cheap, but for the most part. Yeah, yeah I get you. <laughs> there's always ways to be a bigger dickhead. <laughs> there is. Yes. Oh, look, although look, I'm not going to lie. If it works for Matt Mercer, it can work for you. Just auto give one of your players. It's fine. It's, it's true. Give them a way to ungib themselves, but give them for right, sure. Right, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. When yeah, when 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 Talison opens up the fucking Raven Queen uh, chest and it just auto kills Exalia, just like mercs the shit out of her. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, see, that's literally the situation, right? Talison didn't wait. Open the thing was like, guys, it'll be fine. And then a player died and then they didn't do it ever again. I was right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Just dusts my hands off. God, I love being right. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> All right. For all the story, sometimes you got to look at your players and just be like, Edy, what Edy? <laughs> he dies, he dies. If he dies. He dies. Yeah. You ready to hit the next one? Crazy. I, oh, do I have to? Oh, oh, we're swapping. That's right. I think it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot you said that before. <laughs> All right, all right, all right, all right, yeah, 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 whatever. All right. Question for experienced GMs. Okay, I'm not gonna. I was I was tempted to do a voice. The I whole was way. like, are you gonna do a full I, voice? Is that a thing I, we're gonna start doing? It's just I full thought voices about for it. the whole day. I thought about it. Maybe maybe the next one. Hi everyone. I'm a new GM. Started earlier this year, and I've been running a campaign based on a story I've been writing since I was a kid. Red flag. Red flag. Immediately abort. Abort mission. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. It's a bad idea. The main plot is solid. Okay, red flag number two. And I know where the overarching story is headed. All right, that's three red flags in the span of two sentences. Okay. But I'm struggling with the smaller, more localized plot lines, especially during the in-between moments, like when the party is traveling from one location to another or visiting new cities. Okay. Uh, please redeem yourself, sir. I really want to make my NPCs impactful and give my players a reason to feel empathy and attachment towards them. I want my world to feel alive, but I feel lost when it comes to fleshing out smaller details or creating meaningful interactions in towns or on the road. To give a specific example, right now, my players have met an NPC who taught them a hidden power and asked them to help the other Hidden races currently at war with humans. Okay. The party is traveling to find these races, but I'm struggling with creating interesting stories for the cities they visit along the way and making the journey itself engaging. The war is just the beginning of many plots. Oh, God. 
but I'm struggling with how metaphorically, how to metaphorically make the road. Uh, I have locations planned, but I don't know how to create the path or the journey itself. Any advice for experienced GMs on how to handle these smaller plots or create memorable NPCs would be greatly appreciated. Okay, this didn't quite go the, re the way I was expecting. Just good. Um, See, I, I chose this one because it's it's way less cut and dry than it at first seems. Than it seems like at first, yeah. I mean, the way this person said a story I've been writing since I was a kid, the main plot is solid and I know the where the overarching story is headed. Those are all not good. Not good habits to be in. Don't think that way. If you want to write a book, just write a book. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean. Ignoring that bit, they're sort of asking, you know, if I'm if I'm if I'm grokking this correctly, they're asking what the fuck did you just say? No. If I'm grokking this? What does that mean? Where to, does that to, word come from? Uh, where does it come from? I think it's kind of like a, a tech bro Silicon Valley speak. But to grok something means to understand, like you're trying to understand a thing. I Is that why the stupid fucking AI yes, in Twitter is called yeah, grok? Yes, that's why it's called grok, yeah. Oh my god, it's the most ugly fucking oh. word that's like my version of oh. moist i, yeah. I hear no, no, and i'm like absolutely not <laughs> no no that's care. a real that's a real phrase i didn't oh yeah i thought you do that okay anyway yeah no, no, that's a real phrase. no that word makes me want to kill myself um yeah that's why the ai is called that because it's uh, grokking means like to try and like understand the thing um anyway uh, th they're trying to ask how to do the in-between bits connect the major plot points i mean I mean, easy answer number one, just skip over the in-between bits and get to the good bits. <laughs> that's right. Like that's very straightforward. Easy answer. Yeah, valid option. Um, in terms of, in terms of trying to make the in-between bits feel like they matter and the NPCs feel like they matter. You just gotta, I mean, you can't force it, right? If your players don't give a fuck, you, you can't, you can't make them give a fuck, but you have to take any NPCs and, and locations that are sort of in between the major plot bits and you have to give players room to fuck around within those spaces, right? That's. You know, step number one, don't try to like force them to do anything. Just give them space to mess around. Mm -hmm. And just just make NPCs that you think are interesting and your players will glom on to whichever ones they feel like are it like in the same way that when you write, you know, or uh, when a when a story when a book or a show or whatever is written there's a bunch of different characters some people get really attached to one character some people get really attached to another character some people have violent waifu wars over one character versus another and why theirs is superior and all that shit right you just have to make characters that if you're worried for the npc bit specifically you just have to make characters that you feel like have an interesting thing going on tie them to your world and then give the players a reason to care, which is to say, like, if the players, I mean, it would help a lot if this person specified because they talk about like a war. They said they met an NPC who taught them a hidden power and asked them to help the other hidden races. What my immediate thought is, what is the player's position in the conflict? Because if the players are just mercenaries being hired for whoever's got the most money then it's like okay then the way to make your players give a shit is the npc you want them to interact with is the npc with the most money 
if the players are tied to one of the various factions, then you make the NPCs relevant to their faction, whether they be enemies or allied factions or from the same faction. If the players are complete outsiders that have absolutely no understanding of what's going on and are getting like wrapped up into this situation, then the answer becomes you need to give them an NPC or a couple of NPCs that pull them into the situation or maybe give them a place that pulls them into the situation. Like maybe you give them a home and that home is then tied to the greater war. This person didn't specify the player's position in this, which makes it a little difficult. And I think part of the problem maybe is this person doesn't actually know where the players should fit in this situation. That might actually be the problem. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I I was thinking of that too, is like they wrote this plot out, but... Didn't leave room for they players. Potentially... Yeah, they potentially had an idea for what their protagonist should look like, and now these grungly little weirdos do not fit into that mold. Yeah. Um, for me, on my end of things, playing off of what you had said earlier about, like, you know, you can't make NPCs fun or enjoyable. You make NPCs, and the players will decide if they're fun or enjoyable. Yeah, they decide I, yeah, which I mean, ones they I agree they with like. that 100%. Um, I chose this one because I w- I've been thinking about this in my game, uh, and I thankfully I know my players enough to uh, where I could sort of key in on certain personality traits can, that I was like oh they go for this you can grok what NPCs they might like <laughs> I nope not gonna use that word I refuse I fucking hate that I'm not even gonna make that an ironic thing that I start saying I just refuse okay I will no okay yeah yeah uh-uh. anyway yeah um you know. To endear a NPC to a player, in my opinion, I think that the the most surefire way of making that happen is to A, give players space to breathe. If players always feel like they're on a time crunch, if there's always like the next plot point they have to hit to make your miraculous schedule, they're not going to give a fuck about anything going on outside their little circle because... They'll feel like if you if they don't complete the next objective, then a town is going to burn and then they're going to be blamed for it. Right. Um, I've literally felt this happen in a campaign, several, in fact, where you know there's a bunch of really cool characters that the GM introduced, but it's like, nope, we got to collect the random fucking dragon crystals or whatever. We don't got time for you, buddy. Sorry. Uh, another way to do it is to make the characters, the NPCs in question, feel like they have a spot, like a a place sort of nestled within the setting. You know, uh, if you can have Scrimblo Bimblo, the cabbage merchant, all you want, but if that's where that character starts and ends, I mean, like, the characters will like him because they're like, oh, it's that fucking guy, but they won't really endear themselves or, you know, that NPC will not be endeared to them in any real way. Um, well, sometimes they I've will, just sort of learned sometimes they will. Yeah, sometimes like, it's just not, completely out of random. You have no control or no fucking clue. It just sort of happened. That happens too. <laughs> yes, it does. But, you know, make a character feel like a person, not a character. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. make them feel f- um, um, make them feel uh, complete. Like they're not one dimensional. Like they feel like a whole. I mean, a whole character slash a whole person, like make them feel like there's some they have their own desires and they do stuff and they like live a life and yada yada yada. Don't yeah. make and them like you don't, don't need make, to like don't make them a mechanic, right? If you have a character who's a merchant, don't just make them the merchant guy, right? Make it so they have like a wife and a kid and like they live somewhere and they give a shit about X, Y, and Z thing. And if there's a war going on, maybe they have an opinion on the political situation, you know, stuff shit like that. Yeah. Um I think a perfect example of this, and I literally just got the the moon seal of approval. Uh, the other day, one of the NPCs that I introduced at the beginning of, the, of my new Lancer campaign is their like head mechanic, who is like a quirky little gearhead. She like listens to her music way too loud, and I describe constantly that like the other mechanics are like, "Can you turn that shit down?" Uh, the the little minute quirks that a person has, like listening to their music too loud, or um really liking a certain band just like small things that you don't even have to write out you can just think them up like what does a person 
like this do? How do they act? And we all met those people, right? Like me and me and Josh went to art school. I could I could write a fucking thesis on all the weird quirks our friends have slash had. Each of those could make a complete character in themselves. Had until we killed them. In Minecraft, yeah. Sure. Oh, I mean, yes. For example, there was someone that we both knew who uh, could never have their own thought. They just used, I guess, all the time. Infuriating personality trait. Uh, but that could be an NPC that would absolutely get players to think about the like, like, hey man, how are we good? I guess. Uh, do you got any money for this next mission? I guess. Bro, you really unlocking some PTSD. <laughs> I I am. I I thought about it today while I was at work. But like, unironically though, that is a quirk as weird as it sounds that a person, real person has. That's unique. That like. NPCs will be like, our characters will be like, oh, it's the I guess guy. Yes. And they will attempt to get more out of that character. And if they do, be it circumstance or story reasons, congrats, you just endeared a character to the players. You did it. Um, as for the minor plot points, in a very similar vein, don't decide. Who, that's not your problem. If you are really dead set on this storybook sort of approach you've got, and I don't think you should be, frankly. I mean, I, I, the only reason why we're not telling you not to is because that's the rules. Um, but if you are really fixed on this, the minor plot points will sort of write themselves because well, the players will, see, will, will seek them out. They, they if said, you're like, oh, well, there's a... They were talking yeah. about, like, travel between specifically... So I don't know yeah. if they mean modern minor plot points so much as they mean like getting from town A to town B and how to do something with that, you know? Well, so yeah, yes, I see what you're saying. To me, I, I sort of read that as they have the key story beats made, but the like, you know, dealing with the goblin infestation in the small town, that's not something that's been written out. And again, to me, I've just sort of learned that those small things come from the players themselves. You know, they, you can just mention shit offhandedly yes. and players go, oh, well, you said there was goblins in that town. What do we do about the goblins? And this is where it takes a little improv on yours, the GM's part, but you're like, oh, you know, there are reports that these goblins are attacking this town. They might have like a manticore that looks at hand, uh, you know, bees. You know what I mean? Like. They'll make themselves, the players will become interested in them, and now you've just developed your own tiny little side Yeet? quest to do that can bring them to the next town over. And once they're there, just start rattling things off. And, you know, write shit down. Don't just start making things up on the fly. Have some small ideas that players might be at become attached to, and they will more often than not find their own fun that you can therefore provide. Yeah, and and also if the traveling, if the in between they're referring to is the traveling bits specifically, because they do mention that. I mean, if it's just not vibing, then just you can skip over it unless you have a particularly strong idea. That's. that's yeah, uh, think, yes, th this is the one where I think we'll we'll allow ourselves the just don't. If, if you're really like buggered about travel, just don't do well, it. Well, it's like, sort of the less important part of this anyway. But also, if you yeah. are really worried about the travel thing, I will say, um, you know, the way to make travel interesting on a very high level, there's some very specific. You could do an entire hour long back and forth about making travel work, <clears throat> which we may or may not have already done. Did we do that already? I don't know. I believe um, we did. Yeah. Maybe. Bro, we're almost 200 episodes deep. I, uh, yeah, Emily, yeah. What's that? I know. Um, it, it, 120 something. Um, it, but yeah, if you, it's like if you want to do make travel interesting, the, the most high level way to deal with it is just to have events and moments along the way during the travel that make the travel interesting. You know, like they run into some traveling gnomes who are like, you know, are some merchants they run into a random orc attack they run into you know if you have this whole war plot line going on which again they didn't 
get into very much, but maybe they run into a faction that's like, you know, uh, like they're uh, opposing and they have to deal with that situation that they can't just like immediately kill outright or whatever. You know, have moments, have events. That tends to be how you make the travel a thing. Mm. Because a certain amount of tra- traveling is going to feel mundane no matter what. Because, you know, think about traveling in real life, right? You don't remember the entire... You go on a road trip, you don't remember the entire the entire road trip. But you remember when you got off at that one rest stop and then, like, the McDonald's employee threw a chocolate shake at somebody's face and there's a screaming match or whatever you remember the event there but you don't remember the two hours of driving you did before that where nothing particular happened you were just listening to the final fantasy 14 soundtrack the whole way through you know Mm. yeah you know i agree yeah i think we pretty concisely yeah but also don't try to don't try to make your own story god damn it (laughs) Don't try oh, to, yeah, no, just don't, don't try to write your damn like, book. Uh, you bad, are doing so much work that you don't need to do that will ultimately you'll be disappointed by because your players will ignore it. <laughs> yeah, just like for you, you seem like a well enough person. You're not like, no, they need to do this. Good, good on that front. But you really, <laughs> yeah. you got to you doing let it go way more. Let it go. I can't stand that fucking song. Oh, it never bothered. I don't know. I, I don't like it. Oh, it never bothered me anyway. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> move on. Move on. Before Disney sues us. I. I. It, it, you. You reason. It, you. <laughs> for Disney suing us? Yeah, I know. Oh, God. First, we're going to get canceled. Number now we're going to get sued. Burger King food. <laughs> Brett, do the thing, but only do the do the thing, but only the bees. Do it again, and make it base boosted. I don't know what the fuck you're He's done it in one episode already. I keep every time I make him do it, he does it. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I guess we'll see. He does the Burger King foot lettuce thing, but every first syllable of every word is a B. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. It's so cursed. He'll do it. I have faith in him, mainly because he already has the audio file. <laughs> I don't get paid enough for this shit. Bumber Beef Tea, Burger Bing Butt Battis, but Basking Boo Bomb Bunner, Burger Bing Burger Biz, Bum Bum Bouncers, Butt Bungus, But Bassy Boo Bow, But Bye Bee Bapu Bet. Oh my god. Ugh, I, I got the stupid long one. Right. Do, wait, hold on. Based on this, you do did. I have all the stupid long ones? Uh, you might. You, me, you okay no you have one stupid long one i have one stupid long one. all right listen all bud right, that's fair. this is you you made these choices like all right rest in your own i grave. did i i look you're gonna be resting there with me okay all right all right uh, all right all right relax you okay <laughs> question need help for a tricky situation my campaign is in Description. I wrote way too long. Just dropping the link. But the <laughs> yep. link says. Oh, boy. <clears throat> Hi, I am running a D&D esque campaign with a semi futuristic theme. And recently, my players, I have found ourselves in a very tricky spot, which my players are a bit mad about. So first, for some I, context, I, hold, 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 I just. Semi futuristic theme. D- what do you. Do you mean setting or do you mean thematic elements or do you mean dramatic persona? Like what, what do you mean by that? I'm going to assume theme. I would assume. I'm assuming Eberani Magitech. Yeah. Setting, not theme setting. I look brother. Leave me alone. There's a difference. I know. So first some context. The party was recently informed that an unknown person, them being a servant of the evil faction, assassinated one of their close friends, having them come there to solve the mystery of the murder. I intended them to try and solve the mystery, rewarding them if they managed to do it, but also having a backup in case they weren't able to, in the form of an envelope uh, at the scene of the crime, saying, if you're desperate for information, call this number. 
That was your first mistake. <laughs> yep. The purpose was to make them, uh, or yeah, sorry. The purpose was to make them call a mysterious person. Yes. The same person who actually committed the murder to possibly locate them or do as the voice says and meet them to exchange information for an important item. The party had with them. However, when the party found the envelope, they pretty much immediately called the number and wanted to go to the meeting. Completely missing the murder mystery plotline. The thing was, I intended for them to actually discover that this meeting was a trap set out by the murderer to actually kidnap them, and they just threw themselves right into it. Well, now. As I planned, the party was captured after receiving the information they wanted and giving away the item, which they were a little mad about because, for them, it looked like I just forced them to be kidnapped. When I decided that would be fair, that it would be fair to have a little bit going right for them to balance things out. Wait, 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 oh, wait, wait, wait. I I then decided. <laughs> yeah, I then decided. I then decided that it would be it, it would be fair to have a little bit going for, uh, going right for them to balance things out. However, again, this backfired horribly. This is sort of also where you messed up. The party was sent to a prison, which they were able to escape from but they decided to escape in the direction of one of the locations I intended for them to get to later. By this point, I couldn't do anything. That's incorrect. Since the plan was already in action, and they were arriving there. Already the situation was pretty awful, but it got even worse. They ended up arriving in said location and immediately tried to contact someone they knew. I was prepared for this, and told them that there were towers blocking... There's two uses of the word blocking there. Potential signals from traveling to and from the location. However, they didn't stop and decided to build a radio telescope to bounce their signal off the surface of the moon, eventually establishing a stable connection and being able to get at least a message sent. I was fuck? dumbfounded. Yes, the idea was brilliant. This sounds like a me thing, doesn't it? A little bit. <laughs> I'm just confused. The idea was brilliant. How, how did they have the tools to build a radio telescope in, in prison? It's a very fucking good question. Uh. And it definitely would get them the help. But the entire point of this location was that they were supposed to be stuck here with no help from the outside, even if they got there. So now they are planning to wait for help to arrive. Leak the, uh, the very important information to the whole world, which could absolutely derail the entire campaign and build an army to easily, dis uh, easily defeat the evil faction. And that's where the campaign currently sits. However, there's also one more key detail about it, which has made the party angry the most. See... As I previously mentioned, I intended for them to find and get the secret location late. So I find to find and get get to okay the secret location late. I wanted to minimize the risk of them getting there accidentally, so I made the map of the world, which is on a planet, I, I would assume so, intentionally cropped and have a dark fog effect around it, indicating the unexplored terrain. To not raise any suspicion and early ideas as to where to go we explore these parts, Oh, yeah, yeah. No. I, I keep putting emphasis. I, I put emph uh, emphasis, emphasis on the wrong syllable yeah, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this made the players angry uh, because they thought the planet was smaller than it really was, and they should have known about the planet literally being half undiscovered. Uh, I honestly agree with their points and feel bad for making a lot of unjust decisions when developing the campaign. However, I don't want them to just easily get the past evil faction. Yeah. Uh, how do I redeem these mistakes and make it fair for everyone? I, I mean... Okay, well, I will say first thing off the bat, it's it's not unreasonable to say to your players, hey, this is the area of operation that we are playing in. Don't go out beyond the bounds of the play zone, please. Don't just don't make my life harder. That's a perfectly reasonable request. You can come yes. up with some in-universe bullshit reason for why that's a thing, but you don't have to. You could just say to your players, like, this is the play zone. Don't go outside it. Yes. Um... <sighs> This really just sounds like a classic, like, I don't know that I even have anything useful to say here. This sounds like a classic case of, I tried to railroad my players, they didn't do the thing I was expecting to do when I put them on the railroad, and then I tried to railroad them back, and then they just did 8 million other things to try and get off the railroad, and then we just had a constant war between the railroad and the getting off the railroad over and over again. Like, <sighs> yep. Like, you, you wanted them to solve the murder mystery situation in one specific way. Already, you fucked up. Like, there's, you don't want to ever have one method of situational... Or, what? You don't want to ever have one method of solving the situation. That's almost always a bad idea. And then this idea that, oh, they found the note too soon. Don't... 
if you wanted them to find the note later, the note should not have been there in the murder scene. They should have gotten the note some other way afterward. Like, for example, they investigate the scene and they go, well, we didn't find anything. Uh, let's go maybe see if the police captain has something to say. And then the police captain says, oh, we did find this note. And then he hands them the note, right? Like, don't don't just leave it sitting there if you don't want them to find it immediately. But also don't give them only one possible like solution to investigating the mystery. And then once you stick them on the prison island, don't just tell them no to every plan they have. And then you say no, and then it ruins the whole situation somehow, which I, I cannot fathom how them getting some sort of information about the evil bad guys would destroy, would derail the entire campaign. I really am confused as to what that could possibly be because we got no yeah. details on that. But like... D- if they have an idea for how they can call for help and it seems re- like just let them do it. Well, how did they build a radio telescope? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> like. Hello. I, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of questions. I, I like I don't know what to say to like. I don't know what to say to this person. I really don't. You you. You did the classic GM thing. You like you tried to railroad them down a specific there is one solution and then they didn't go with your one solution. And then your entire process from that point on has been trying to railroad them back onto that one solution. And now at this point, it's basically a game for them to try their damnedest to not let you like. Now it's more fun for them to try and stop you from railroading them. Like now that is the game is to be like, haha, we're going to fuck with you because you've made you have tried to put them on it too hard. <laughs> I think something that um, it's it's that the- I, I kind of keyed on to on this, <laughs> but I, I think a lot of people don't think about is. Uh-huh. You can improv yourself into trouble. Like sure. a lot of times people are like, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I didn't write anything down. Usually improv will solve your issue, but you have to know when to stop. Like, I applaud you for being like, I didn't write down what I thought we had to like, you know, I didn't write down multiple solutions. So I wanted to give them options. Even if I didn't like where it was going, I wanted to give them something and hopefully I could sort of worm them back onto didn't. the path. But that's not what he did. He gave them one. Oh, but he did, so- though. Well, no, he gave them one solution and then kind of a like uh, a backup solution. But then he specifically said that, oh, they they got the backup solution too quickly. Yes. So that part, that was full railroading. But the whole thing with them going to prison and in like the GM allowing them to break out, allowing them to make the radio telescope, allowing them to get to the new land that they weren't supposed to get to. If he was really railroading them, like the second they had broken out, they would have been like disappeared by the like good guy secret organization and brought back to the starter area. You know what I mean? But it was just the constant like yes ending and nor no budding that I think like to the, to the OP's di- uh, 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 discredit or not discredit to their detriment brought the players farther away from where they wanted them to be. You know what I mean? This is really a thing. And I know we said, don't just say, talk to your players. It's more than that. You have to like hard cut the brakes and say, okay, guys, wait, wait, wait. We, we really got a little off topic. There was more stuff for you to do. You like, yes, you found the envelope. You weren't supposed to find this soon to be fair. Full disclosure, but you did find it. You called the number, you know, from that jump, the solution would have just been Or, you know, you don't even have to, like, really mask off it. Go, once they have the number, tease it out and just say, well, there might be more stuff in the room. There might be more stuff going on. You don't know that you trust this number. Right, right. Yeah. Sow some seeds of doubt into them (sighs) soon. Well, say say shit out of out of character, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. You don't have to constantly yes and a no, but your way back to where you want to be. Sometimes just giving them like a little push, like a keep going. You're doing good. Keep going. You found the envelope. Congratulations. Keep going. Because once the players know that there's more stuff and they don't have to just assume or guess or rely on roles that could fuck them, they're more likely to go do that thing. 
Well, yeah, and part of the problem is is trying to so solve every solution 100% in character and or in game can sometimes run in like lead to some problems. So sometimes it is better to say on a like player like player to GM level. Yes, you're on the right track. There's another thing here. Like I meant for you to do something else. I kind of fucked up. So like don't leave quite yet or whatever, you know. Or if you yes. fucked up really, really bad, which maybe the radio telescope situation, you did fuck up really, really bad. Just say to them, you know, can we retcon that? Because I, I I, really shouldn't have let you do like that really fucked things up. I should not have let you done that. Uh, can we just can we discuss some alternatives or something, you know, like yes. at a certain point, because trying to do everything 100 percent in game slash in character I think people try to do that a lot and it often gets them in trouble. Like you tried to put your player, you tried to put the players on a railroad. They broke your railroad. You then tried to put them back on the railroad a hundred percent in character, as opposed to just stopping the train and being like, uh, excuse me, there's going to be some delays while we repair the railroad. <laughs> you know, like sometimes you need to stop the train. <laughs> That's really how I feel about that, because like, it's just also the fact that your players did something that by all accounts is a logical idea, which is to say, like, call for help that breaking the entire plot, like, damn, bro, you built your plot on toothpicks and duct tape like Jesus Christ. <laughs> like shit broke too easy. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're exaggerating or something or 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 maybe there's extra information that would make that statement make more sense that they didn't put in the post. I don't know. But like on the face of it, that look that look a little silly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have any strong advice. I, I have I have no strong assistance on this one. <laughs> really don't. I mean, I think we gave some pretty good assistance. Like, you know, th there's the like standard don't railroad you know it's okay to go mask off yeah I mean, give them a little like like the the op was like oh i you know i wanted to to give them something that like helps to go like you know want things to go for right for them for once that thing could have been as simple as telling them to keep going when they were investigating the murder yeah yeah say to them like you're sort of on the right track keep looking or whatever and sometimes yeah. be all you need <laughs> See, we uh, solved the problem and didn't tell them. Just talk to your players about it. <laughs> well, you are talking to players, but not not in the way that people it wasn't usually, just that it wasn't just that. Yeah, a little more than when people would then just not in the exact way that people mean when they say that phrase. All right. Next one's on me here. Yep. I, I created a dungeon and need a little help, so it's kind of brief and I would like to make it a little longer. How could I do it without endless battles? Okay. Uh, the, the, the post is kind of brief, too. Um, yeah. I mean... I think the best way, if you want to have a dungeon that isn't just endless battles, and, you know, sometimes endless battle dungeon can be kind of a fun time. Um, but... I think the the easiest way to go about that is 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 very simply design a dungeon the same way you would design any other extended adventure, right? Which is to say, add in combat, add in like puzzles, add in social elements, add in exploration elements, right? Add in rooms where the players come in and. Uh, they're like, you're like, oh, this room seems to be mysteriously empty. Uh, there's nothing like, you know, you come into this room and you don't immediately see an exit to this room, you know? So now there's like a mystery of like, how do we get out? Or maybe, okay, we have to look around. Like, that's like an exploration thing. You can add in social elements. Like the players come into a room and they find a group of bandits or some shit. And they're like, who the hell are you guys? And the bandits are like, we were here trying to find X, Y, or Z thing. And then we found out this place is infested with undead. And now we're like kind of trapped. And 
you want to help us and then the players are like i don't know you're bandits i don't know if we want to help the bandits but also like we could use some assistance getting through this area you know then you add like a social encounter like just add the different types of stuff that you would add in your normal DD adventure and just put them into the microcosm that is the dungeon because a dungeon is essentially a mini adventure anyway Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would <laughs> hmm. try to think you, you, you once again, took didn't too much. give me these spaces to jump in. No, no, you, you covered it. Fuck. I, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I was too quick. Shoot no, no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think. Like, hmm. You know, a, a, a dungeon is essentially... A, a a tiny I mean a dungeon in real life is not that but a dungeon in, in the D&D sense is a tiny little microcosm of existence right so you can put basically any kind of element you want you know as long as it's makes sense for the most part and what makes sense in D&D could be uh, a wide array of things True. I actually, so no, I do have one that again, we're going to bend the rules a little bit. <laughs> yeah. My question is sort of, or not sort of, my question is, this. you would like to make it a bit longer. Why? I mean, why? Uh, because it, I, I'm, I'm asking this because of personal experience, because I found myself in the exact same fucking position like two years ago where I was, I wanted the dungeons to be big and grand and like, feel like real like dungeon delvey dungeons but i found that frankly a five room dungeon with two puzzles in one combat not only makes your life so much easier as a dungeon master the players will appreciate it because they don't feel like they're stuck there for fucking ever but when things are brief you use a lot less brain power trying to fill up 20 rooms and you can put way more brain power into filling three to make a five room dungeon, right? First yeah. room, trap room, <laughs> combat room, puzzle room, treasure. Yeah. And at least from personal experience, because the players know that it's not that big, they go, oh, well, if there's no like there, there's, you know, if we're going full lean meat, there's no fat to trim. The rooms must be kind of crazy and you can make them crazy. In, in like very simple ways, you know, very basic out of the box thinking. It's yeah, it's, um, it's the it's the video game concept of like instead of making a gigantic op open world game, if you make a much more focused 20 hour experience, those 20 hours are probably going to be solid bangers as opposed to a 50 hour game with 20 to 30 good hours in it. And then, you know, 20 to 30 bad hours. Yes. Yeah, it's like if you tighten um, it up. Perfect example of this. In that, you know, five room or whatever dungeon I did, one of the rooms was they were on a ship that was taking on water. Uh, I think like they were in like an oil tanker. And one room was just as simple as the door that they need to exit is across the room. The room, room is filled with water and a stray electrical cable is in the water. And now there's a bunch of debris in the water, but they can't touch the water without taking damage and a player and this is a level like 11 party and you'd think oh well they're level 11 they'll just have a million solutions for this and to be fair if it was actual magical DD, they would they didn't because of telescopes but that bred like an hour and a half of creative thinking from the players one player has is like Iceman, so he's like oh well, i can freeze the water a little bit and that will help me like stand on it or float on it. And that'll help. And one player had like a deployable, like emergency life raft. They used that and then immediately poked a hole in it, which was really funny. And then they had to problem solve keeping the boat afloat and not being electrocuted to death once they touched the water. You know, like the solutions created problems to create solutions. And it was it took. 10 minutes on my part to just think about some basic ideas of like, oh, maybe they can turn the power off with like a, a you know, the the typical like keypad, uh, you know, 
jumble of wires at the door that you see in every like Star Wars movie, stuff like that. I promise you, unless it's literally two rooms, you don't have to do as much as you're thinking. Like, yes, a little longer, but I don't even think you have to do that, frankly. Just make what you got good and you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this person gave literally no, I mean, the, the post was literally one sentence. So, like, they gave no details. They just said it's kind of brief and I want to make it a little longer. Yeah, the immediate, like like you said, the immediate question becomes, like, why do you want to make it a little, uh, like, longer? And is making it longer actually going to help? Or do you just think it is? Right, like, because if yeah. you just think it's gonna be better if it's longer, but you don't necessarily have any good ideas for how to make it longer, then maybe making it longer is not a better idea. So, just don't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you're basically always better making less but more dense content versus more, but like, ver you don't, you don't want to be, uh, the Bethesda wide as an ocean, deep as a puddle situation in your D and D game. There's, there's no reason to do that. You want to be, you know, wide as a puddle, deep as an ocean instead. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, that generally is more beneficial. I mean, there might be, scenarios where I would say there's an exception, but for the most part, I mm. you know, I'm looking at it and these are, I, I feel like I may have softballed a couple of, now I'm kind of annoyed at myself. Softballed them in what way? Uh, I mean, like I, I knew, yeah, I knew that they were simple, but I may have been like, well, they, these are too long, so I'm just going to go with the simpler ones. I mean, I some of them definitely, but well, I could I, I feel like I could have put some more sauce in it. As we just said, longer, not always better. True, true. Uh, I guess it's my turn. It is. <clears throat> Question. Respect at the table. Question, uh, description. What are your rulings around the table to avoid conflict? I've always read about session zero, walls and veils, etc. Conceptually, they're pretty good, but the implementation is always so boring. If I have a player at the tavern, uh, yeah, that at the tavern, they in the in brain, <laughs> yeah. they instantaneously start to flirt with everything outside of story rel uh, related motives. Shouldn't we simply ask, why are you role playing this part? Does this contribute to the story? How do you integrate the other players? I, uh, I really find online advice strange. Um, what are your? This one's a little multifaceted, actually. I yeah, I, I'm, so I'm I, almost I mean, slightly confused about what the question even is. Like, so I believe that the the issue is from when I read this originally, is that the GM is annoyed that they have players running off doing random bullshit that isn't really progressing the plot in any way, but they don't want to get into a fight about it at the table. So they want to know what to do and are sort of questioning session zero uh, when talking about setting expectations. I don't think they're using walls and veils here correctly, unless they're talking about flirting with everything, in which case, you know, is the bard trying I, to I like think what they're actively saying. describe how they plow the dragon? Yeah, yeah, um, I think it's that kind of a thing, like lines and veils on actively describing how the bard rails the dragonborn. Um, yeah. And they don't want to necessarily do that deal with that <laughs> yes i so the, uh it does say here that english is not their first language right right so i'm gonna give the implementation is always so boring a pass that sounds weird like that's written very strangely yeah boring um, as in yeah <sighs> Boring. Yeah. What? How? What do they mean by boring exactly? Like, are I, they? I think that might be a translation issue. Yeah, I can see that. Um. So I said I was just going to ignore that one because that, much like some of this, provides nothing to the story. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe they're. I, I guess what they might be saying by boring is is like it, it waters down the game itself. Maybe. 
Maybe. I mean, that is a common complaint that I see from a lot of people who talk about safety rules. Yeah, because you go and around as, and you 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 say to everyone, what do you not want to deal with? And one person says sexual stuff. One person says racial stuff. One person says slavery. Another person says intense violence. And then you go, OK, well, t- at least two of those, th- those things were maybe going to be part of the plot. So how do I, you know, maybe that's what it means by boring. Like you, they like you're sort of over, like over censoring almost like going overboard. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and I mean, I mean, this really, uh, we did a whole episode about the X card and shit. We did. Yeah, uh, this pretty much is going to go back to what I said in that, which is that if you don't want to do the strict if you don't want to do the strict lines and veils or X card rule as it's described commonly on the internet or whatever then I would say establish discuss with your players before the game starts and establish during that session zero rather than like like establish a (laughs) Establish a work culture, if you will, of discussing things like when they come up, like say to your players, this is roughly the vibe I'm going to hit. Like I'm going to try and be PG 13. We're going to try and be R rated. Or if you want something a little more useful, say to your players, we're going to run our game like Avatar. We're going to run our game like on the polar opposite berserk uh i want my game to be tonally like final fantasy 16 i want my game to be tonally like dragon quest right give give relevant um comparisons you know if you say to me i want our game to be kind of mass effect-esque then i go okay so like sex stuff is on the table but we're not necessarily going to explicitly talk about like throbbing vulvas or some shit. Um, But if you say to me, I want my game to be like Halo, I'm going to say, okay, so sex stuff not on the table, uh, but like heinous war crimes on the table. (laughs) Right. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like use, use stuff that your players are familiar with. Because, you know, you're all playing D&D, so I'm sure you fucking nerds watch anime or play video games or read books or something. So um, use use comparatives and then say if at any point that that's the general establishment. And then if at any point within those bounds that I'm pre-establishing, if you feel like I'm pushing too far or maybe you agreed to a thing and then you decided like, all right, can we maybe do a little less of that? Just establish a kind of table Uh, a table culture of can we pause real quick? Can we maybe do a little less of that? Like, can we just talk about it real quick? And then you as the GM just be ready to kind of pivot. That way you don't necessarily have to put hard lines and veils, but you establish the open conversation bit of the situation. Especially if you're playing with people, you know, which this person did not specify if they're playing with people they know or don't know. But if you are playing with people, you know, it's a lot easier to just say, hey, this is the tone I'm going for. If you're really, really uncomfortable, just tell me in the moment and then I'll deal with it in the moment. You know, that's harder, of course, if you're not dealing, you know, if it's not people, you know. Uh, But again, they didn't specify, so can't really say one way or the other on that one. I don't know. I don't know if you have anything to add on that one. No, I think we both said our piece. That one, I don't know. That one's always such a... The idea of, like, um, what's okay at the table and what's not okay, like, subject matter-wise, that's always such a... a, It's I don't know. It's just such a table-by-table scenario. You really got to vibe it out with who you're sitting at the table with it, it it's really i feel like it's really hard to establish any hard fast rules on that one yeah i mean i guess the one thing i would say that you already sort of brought up is like you know establish what the vibe of the game is going to be like it just sounds like this dm 
either, you know, doesn't want the graphic depictions of plowing a dragon or a little more chari- uh, a little less charitably isn't really interested in the like players telling personal stories thing like the, the little moments that a lot of people really enjoy right which like fair enough that's fine you can be like that um what i would say there is you know in the same way that you expect players to go full in on like your plot stuff and really be invested they have to be invested in themselves to be invested in you right they don't give a fuck about their their character they're not going to give a fuck about your story so you got to give them a little leeway if you want your way also side note i find it weird that they titled this respect at the table and then we're talking about lines and veils yeah i that's a little I, I don't know that that like respect is not necessarily the word there, I feel like. But well, yeah, I mean, once again, the person said English is not their first language. I'm just yeah, gonna I know. We've got some typos. And we have to play pull some. I chose this one because it was interesting. A little confusing, but I, I you know, I, I liked the spirit that it had. Uh, uh, LOL. Uh, side note, scrolling through some of the responses they gave. Somebody said set the tone often, often with reference to other media. My yeah. Call of Cthulhu game uses a dark, dramatic tone similar to Peaky Blinders. <laughs> All right, uh, is this me? Oh boy! Oh boy! Yep. Oh, oh this, is a, this is a thick, thick lad. This post. I think this is the thickest one. Has been deleted. No. Yep. No. Stop. It's been deleted. No. By the person. This was so saucy. No, you can't. You fuck. You gotta be fucking kidding me right now. Yep. Yes, sir. Bro. I, you're getting it live, folks. Getting what live? God damn it. Ah. Do you have any semblance of remembering what it was? Not at all. Dude, it was law. It was probably. It was probably. Like double the length of the fucking. Oh, um. The uh, 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 tricky situation one. Oh. It was a long one, but it was, dude, there was so much, oh man, I was really excited for this one. Why, 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 what was there? Go. Because there was a lot of interesting stuff going on with players. Oh, I do kind of know what it was about. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, the, the main one was the OP has a Vampire the Masquerade game where they are not super well versed in the lore, but they know enough to run a game. Mm -hmm. And there are several players in the party who are constantly well actually the DM because they know a lot more about Vampire oh, the Masquerade God. and World of Darkness in general and are therefore trying to weasel out better roles and better results based on their knowledge over the GM and basically being like, you need to trust me, bro, because I just know more than you. Um, but there was also a lot of really in like interesting stuff about metagaming and like, yeah, it, it was a really good post. Uh, yeah, I mean... The title of it is Thinking of Quitting as a GM After My Party Pulled Some Metagaming Nonsense to Kill them to Kill a Major NPC Earl. Yeah. So that's quite yeah, a Yeah, there was also some railroady stuff in there. Yeah, it was Ooh. Dude, I the wind has been thoroughly yanked from my fucking sails. That sucks. Uh well. Uh. I guess I'll do the next one. It be that way sometimes. Dells. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not without reading it. I'm not going to try and formulate it kind of thought because that feels. It's ingenuous. No, that's fair. That's very <laughs> fair. Uh, All right. Well. Next one it is then. What's the best way? What? No. What's the best way to okay. set this up with the player's freedom to choose a side in mind? 
What's the what is what's the best way to set this up with the player's freedom to side in mind? I get what they mean. Not a great sentence. Yeah, I'm steeping back into the shoot. I just want to be clear. They 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 put steeping. They did not put. St- that's not me misreading it. They spelled it steeping. <laughs> so we're clear. <laughs> I realized they meant stepping, but they put steeping. Yeah. I'm stepping back into the shoes of being a GM after years of being out of them. After after years of being a forever G. Who? Okay, grammar. This person never heard of it. After years of being out of them, comma, after years of being a forever GM. I have an idea for a story to run. I mean, uh, red flags all around. But I am not fully sure the best way to have the players be able to choose a side or have their own thing outside of both choices. What? Or have their own thing outside... As in, give them a third option? Is that, I guess, what he's saying? Yeah, if, if they don't want to choose a side, they can do their own thing. Yeah, okay. The TLDR of the plot is Overwatch. Wow, that's an immediate... That's a strong, strong red flag. Um, basically, the Adventurer's League, stand-in name, <laughs> started, did good work, people loved them, AI grew, had bad people in their ranks as they grew... Did they mean AL? Maybe they meant AL. They're not AI. Adventurers League grew. Had bad people in the ranks as they grew. Started an internal war as more and more things came to light, etc., etc. However, oh yeah, because they put AL here. However, when the war in the AL was over, Adventurers League, the good side won and ousted the bad, but that still left the damaged reputation of the Adventurers League, as well as the fact that more than 80% of their professional adventurers left, either to avoid the war because they were corrupt or dead, die, either to avoid the war or because they were corrupt or dead. Grammar, my man. Many outposts abandoned either due to the. Why is there a comma there? I'm sorry, I'm having a stroke trying to read this. <laughs> Either due to lack of people to hold them, hatred of the local populations, or both. There'd have been a comma after populations. Players will be <laughs> players will be new recruits joining. There doesn't need to be a comma there. We'll have a harsh shock test session one. There should be a period there. Basically, a hard fight that they can win. <laughs> there, this is a this is a very long run on sentence. But th- okay, hold on. I'm gonna reread this sentence. There's no periods, just to be clear. Players will be new recruits joining, comma. We'll have a harsh shock test, session one, comma. Basically a hard fight they can win, comma, but can also be saved by some of the remaining Adventurer League who are testing them by setting up a hard fight, likely skeletons in large number. Period. Comma. Maybe a period. I can't tell based on the, the font. No, I think that's a period that time. Okay, that was quite the run nonsense. Yes, there's about three, three and a half sentences in there. Yeah, I am worried that this initial fight right off the bat or the RP afterwards might not go well or discourage them from being able to choose to 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 choose to either join Adventurers League, leave Adventurers League or the coalition also or the coalition also stand in name or do neither comma, but be caught in the crossfire, comma, and their ability to see those who remain are hopeful, are the hopeful but clueless ones. I think that's a period. Like, say, Reinhardt, no, I think that's a comma, actually. Like, say, Reinhardt or Winston, those who save people for good, comma, selfless means, comma, but have no way to know how to rally the team or properly run and vet it a comma while also having to deal with the bad actions of the Adventurers League of the past. My guy, the run on sentences. <laughs> this is this is really a struggle. <laughs> In addition. Oh, my God. In addition, those who left are either free agents or joined a rising faction, the coalition from before the Adventurers League internal conflict started, 
has a better capacity to protect people and is more structured than the Adventures League used to be. Should be a period there, but also has its own hangups. Comma, mainly not carrying not caring who they have to do the job as long as their job gets done. Okay, there again should have been multiple. This guy with I I'm having a stroke. <laughs> this I guy, hear, I'm having a very good time listening. I, this is a fucking struggle to read. The concept is to allow them to add new people into their group while also having story bits for their characters and easy ways to have new characters join the ranks if when any of them die. Uh, any help on the initial dia would be nice, and I would be grateful. Okay, I, I mean, I, okay, wait, 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 real quick. To uh, start, yeah, learn how to if use you're a period. An OP, that if you're an OP <laughs> posting a question about your campaign, this is a direct call out, Lupo, because you do this shit. Oh God. Uh, give the person you are asking for help only as much context is completely fucking necessary yeah. to get the question out. Yeah. If you bury people under text and subtext of your campaign and all the, the nuanced intricacies of your plot and story, you, lo- or you lose people. Yeah, I mean, I got a little lost halfway through there. I, I get the basic crux of what they're saying, but yeah, there, there was definitely more con. There, there were certain things that's like we didn't really need to know them. Um, yes. Only give people exactly what they need. No more, no less. Whew. So, I mean, I, I like. Okay. Just break this down bit by bit. <sighs> no, I mean, I'm just going to focus on the main part of this. The main crux, which is what's the, which is the first question. What's the best way to set up the player's freedom to choose a side? With a, with the play. I can't. Let them choose a side or let them or or yeah. what is give the them best, the freedom to do their own thing. Yes. What is the best way to set up the player freedom so they can choose a side or choose to do something else? I mean, here's the thing. Incentive. This. Pre- yes. This premise <laughs> from the outset, it, I would say, is a good premise. Maybe don't pl- tell the players that you're 100 percent stealing from Overwatch. But like, yes, this is no, a good. You are yeah, because you are 100 percent I mean, straight are, stealing yeah, from Overwatch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a good premise because, yes, the idea is like there, there was one team. There was a schism in the team. This team broke into two factions that caused tension and all this stuff like that. All of that stuff on paper. Yes. Jives. Solid premise. You could definitely do something with that. You have two major factions. Your players can choose to give a shit or not give a shit about the factions. Right. Sure. You can stick characters within the factions that the players may or may not get attached to. I, I, like. I think so if you as a GM want them to join so we got the Adventurers League and the Coalition the the Coalition are basically the bad guys the Adventurer Leagues are more or less the good guys they both have their own problems but that's kind of the gist of it right much like oh god what were the two sides called in Overwatch whatever doesn't matter Um, so if you're leaning towards you want them to join the adventurers league which seems to be what the idea is then yeah incentivize them with the idea that the adventurers league are you know the better option whether that be like monetarily or morally or maybe like they're more established or 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 something along those lines right like sort of incentivize the adventurers league is the better option if you're leaning towards it but then if they don't choose them if they say no we're going to join the bad guys or no we're going to make our own faction with blackjack and hookers just leave the possibility open and don't make any decisions like let's I assume this person's based on the phrasing this person is asking this the game has not started yet so session one do not make any kind of story beats or plans or anything like that to occur based on a specific, like based on what team they join, make enough content for them to go through up until the decision is made. 
once they make the decision, then you can start teasing out further from there. Like, do not build any, don't build a mission assuming they join the good guys and then they join the bad guys or, or vice versa or whatever, right? Like, don't build anything yet. Essentially, run your first session like an Apocalypse World game where you don't pre-plan any of the fronts. You just run the session and then whatever happens after that first session, you turn the various elements of that first session into your fronts. That will make sense if anybody who's listened to our episode about it and or if, uh, you know, you know about Apocalypse World. But the, the point being is, like, don't predetermine anything. Leave it open. Let them choose and then go from there. But I think the important thing here is if you're going to put all this mental energy towards the, the, the two teams, make sure that no matter what they choose, they are involved with the two teams somehow right if they choose to be on the adventurers league they're getting missions from the good guys etc etc if they choose to be with the coalition then they have missions that are about maybe dismantling the adventurers league or doing some underhanded shady shit some clandestine d dungeon fuckery or whatever and then if they choose to join neither side then make it that whatever they do as a group on their own bumps into the other two factions right they try to do a mission the adventurer league shows up and say hey what the fuck are you doing right like they have to bump into them because if they choose to go off on their own and then don't interact with the two factions it's like you put a lot of brain juice towards nothing yeah uh I think I chose this one because this is something I'm doing in my campaign. Don't frankly, be, uh, don't be married. Uh, don't be married to a to a decision in session one. Yeah, yeah. Um, TLDR version. As for my two cents, what I said before, you know, incentivize players. The long version of that answer is when your players come to you with their backstories, their character ideas, right? They will more often than not key on, you know, specific tropes. The, you know, um, disgraced good guy, a la like Soldier 76 or uh, the, you know, damage slacker turned vigilante in like Genji. I'm just going to use Overwatch things now. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the doctor who couldn't save everyone in mercy. Have those factions ideals either align or intersect with the player's ideals in ways that will cause the players to have conflict between themselves as well as with the plot. And then you, what that will do is that will force your players to make difficult decisions about what they want and what their characters want. And if they decide neither, that's where you've got your third option. You know, if they're like, we just want to, like, we don't agree with any of it. Like, we, we get some of this, but fuck everybody. You know, what Josh said, make sure that that third path will cross paths with the other two factions. For sure, they, it has to. Whether that means, you know, um, both sides are against them or which, in my opinion, is more interesting. The Armored Core route where one side will pay you to fuck with the other guy and then you become a middleman that allows the players to not only subvert the main factions by constantly picking away at them, would make money off of them doing it, you know? Yeah. I think that's a really powerful uh, uh, tool to get is, is to give players the ability to strike out on their own. But also, again, use the, the contacts, the enemies and friends that they already have to do it. Yeah, it has in a to unique run way to the other stuff. I also. Um, it, yeah, if you're if this is all uh, which, again, assuming based on how they wrote it. This is all pre session one. Whatever kind of backstory information the players give you, work that stuff into the factions. So, for example, if one of the players is like, I I always prioritize saving like women and children, regardless of the situation, and then have a character in the coalition, the bad guy faction, who's like, nah, fuck them kids, get that money, right? Because then that player is now invested because someone is actively going against their backstories because any, any amount of like players will always, always without fail. They don't give a fuck about your world until you rope in their backstory and now they care. 
right? Like, as soon as it's about them, they give a shit. Mm -hmm. So you take whatever you have there, or maybe a player has a thing where it's like, you know, always complete the mission from command no matter what, and then the players join the Adventurers League, and then command gives them, like, maybe kind of an iffy mission that's like uh, a little morally ambiguous, but they're like, yeah, but I always do what the bosses says, but they're telling me to do some fucked up shit. I don't know. Like, you know, uh, key that like, keep the, keep the factions a little bit open so you can add that stuff in or add characters as part of the factions that can key off of that player backstory shit. I was just about to bring that up. Uh, one of the best things you can do if you want to sow the seeds of doubt in the factions to have people either switch to a side they weren't expecting or just say fuck it in general to the like the two faction setup is to provide uh, uh, exceptions to the typical rule. So maybe you'll have, you know, the coalition being the bad guys. Uh, you know, maybe you'll have one like grizzled old soldier that's like, ah, yeah, we have to take out this factory for the the Adventures League. And then, you know, one of the players might be like, but there's like women and children in the town nearby. And then he goes, yeah, well, we don't fuck with women and shit. Like, you know, we don't put women and children in harm's way. So do what you can to save them. Make sure they get out. That'll make the player who is like, well, I was going to go the Paragon route go, wait a minute. Hold on. I agree with what he just said. <laughs> but they're the bad guy. But I agree. Inversely, if they're working for the Adventures League and that same player's like, but what about the women and children? And then the good guy goes, we don't have time for them. They go, that wasn't very cash money. That was kind of evil, though. Are you not Paragon route, actually? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sow those seeds of doubt. Have both sides do it and show that neither side is perfect. Don't make them just black and white, good or evil. Well, yeah, you know, I think I think based on the de the description, they based on what they said at the end there, where they were like, uh, the coalition what was it the bit they said um, has some internal uh, internal conflict, who has a better capacity to protect people and is more structured than the AL used to be, but also has its own hangups. Seems like they're already kind of thinking about that. True, fair enough. So, like push it, push it hard. Yeah, yeah, push it as much as you can for sure. If 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 that's what you want to be the crux, if you like, if you want your bread and butter to be the Overwatch war, then yeah, you got to like push the two bits, the two bits, the two sides. You know, <laughs> I, I will say do more than that, though. Don't don't just do the the like ineptitude versus stability thing, because that ultimately ends with NCR versus Caesar's Legion in Fallout New Vegas. And the answer is pretty much universally NCR because Caesar Legion are just evil, like. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that specific reference, but I will say, yes, if you try to overdo, if you try to overdo the ineptitude bit, then like, yeah, it's just going to come across as, well, they're fucking inept. Why would we send to them? Uh, for, for reference, those of you who don't know, the, the, the big crux in Fallout New Vegas is whether or not the, the courier, the main character sides with either Caesar's Legion or the NCR, the New California Republic. Obviously, there's you can side with Mr. House. That's the third option. We're not going to count that for the moment. The big thing is that like uh, the NCR are trying to like rebuild civilization as close to what we can have of like the, the government before everything fell, but they're sort of plagued with ineptitude and like nepotism and bureaucracy. Whereas Caesar's Legion is trying to bring back like unironically the, the glory of the empire of Rome with the good and bad, which is like slavery, you know? Uh, and other bad things that go along with slavery, like having no like uh, like strict caste systems and whatnot. But the whole thing is like, well, merchants like them because when it, uh, you know they don't get attacked by by raiders in Caesar's Legion territory, and you're like, yeah, but they still trade slaves and women don't have rights, so they're still evil. You know what I mean? Like they're not the you don't right they're. It's not even a hard sell. There's no real sale here. They're just the bad guys. You know, speak. All right, slight tangent. I uh -huh. had friends in high school when when New Vegas came out who were like, "No, but see, like the Legion's like unironically correct." And you're like, "Oh, you're one of them. You're one of them, aren't you?" 
It's like, look, point at him. Point at him and laugh. He's got bad opinions. <laughs> got bad opinions. Fair enough. Uh, I guess I'm up next. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, you, you got this, Chief. I believe in you, probably. Yeah. Uh, I, so real quick, I appreciate this one because the next, the, the next uh, uh, poster, right? Strictly was like. There's a bunch of context that you don't need, so they just put it in long story. Haha. I appreciate you. You're a real one. I just want you to know that, OP. <laughs> uh, the title is called Consequences of Your Actions. The description. Hey, guys. I could use a little help with the campaign I'm running. I'm running this three campaign trilogy, and we are currently in the second campaign. Jesus. The entire trilogy is based around Asmodeus trying to break out of the nine hells using the party. Long story. Haha. Thank you. Uh, recently, one of the players has uh, was offered something that had some perks when, and some very serious negatives attached to it as well. He was told if he refused the offer, there would be severe consequences for either him or one of his party members. He refused the offer, which made a ton, ton of sense for him not to accept it. What do you guys think would be good ideas for a severe consequence that isn't punishing but still feels weighty enough? Any ideas would be hugely appreciated. Context, the players are level 12. This campaign will go into level 15. They're currently living in Waterdeep right now and are currently helping Victoro Castellanter. I don't actually know who that is. Become the Lord new open Lord. Deep. I assume he's... Ah. Or one uh, of the, uh, the Castellanter. If you play uh, if you play Dragon Heist Waterdeep, the Castellanters are one of the people you can like help become the Lords of Waterdeep. Gotcha. Uh, said someone said... Uh, uh, against edit. Him. Someone brought up that I didn't bring up the entity, which is a good point. Uh... The offer was from Asmodeus, but it was basically agreeing to be Victoro's hitman in a way that Victoro would have uh, phrases he would use to control the player. So you, you just become the Manchurian candidate. Manchurian candidate. Uh, uh, there are some perks as well. How to punish your players or give your players consequences that doesn't feel like you're just fucking them over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a good question because this is not, um, you know, my players being a baby bitch or whatever. Um, yeah. So, actually, do you mind if I hit this one first? Yeah, I mean, I don't have that strong of a thought. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, I think we have to, to really key in on what the idea of punishment versus consequence is, right? And a lot of that, I think, has to do uh -huh. with intent. And players will pick up on that intent, right? If you've told players that there will be severe consequences. Uh, and assuming that, you know, based on the context of the, the the conversation that wasn't given here, to be fair, between Asmodeus, basically Satan, and a player, you're telling the player, hopefully, that despite bad things that may happen to you, this is not me punishing you for taking the wrong decision. Yeah, right? it's not... It's not um it's not GM to player punishment. It is, it is character NPC to player character consequence. Yes. So what punishments should you enact or what, what consequence should you enact? There isn't much that's off the table right now. No. The one thing that I would say you for sure do not want to do is take away uh, like, don't take away things that aren't relevant to this, right? If the Paladin has a Holy Avenger, don't take away his Holy Avenger. Unless he got it from, like, Lathander, and then in, uh, you know, they're fighting a demon of Asmodeus, and before he can slay the demon, it's got, like, two hit points left, it you know, try it grabs the sword and teleports back to the hells. That's a consequence, right? Well, and then or, have Asmodeus show up and go, or I he, knew your paladin would not be able to do his deed without his holy sword. Come get it from me. If, or if, if that, he offered, that's a consequence. If he offered up the sword as like uh, collateral or some shit. Yeah, that's a consequence. The player waking up after a long rest and just not having the sword and there being no explanation or reasoning behind it, that's punishment. Because you're and that's in that case, you're saying Yeah, it has to be a consequence right for an action. Yeah. 
you you need to have a, an effect to the cause, right? The 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 uh the consequence has to be an equal amount like an equal degree with the action. Like if the action is really, really beneficial, then the consequence can be more severe. If the action is not that useful, the consequence can't be as severe. It's kind of the, from a mechanical like train of thought, it's sort of the idea of if you have a really powerful ability, it costs more ammo. If you have a not as powerful ability, it costs less ammo, you know, whatever that ammo is. Yes. Similar idea. Uh, on a side note, if you're going to affect an NPC, right? You do not be afraid to kill character like favorite NPCs. You know, yes, they'll be upset about it, hopefully only in character. But again, if it feels like it could happen, if it feels like it follows a string of logic, if it the has an should, element of verisimilitude. Yes. <laughs> the players should understand and go, oh, crap, that was the consequence. Once again, right? Yeah, if there's an internal if, logic, if it follows. If the players are killed by a random vampire with no rhyme or reason, punishment. But if it's if the players get back to, like, Waterdeep or whatever, and the, uh, an NPC runs up to them in tears and is like, insert character's name here they're dead and they get there and it's like you know a, a, a vicious crime scene where the dagger of a cultist is in there uh, it is it, like in the chest of the NPC they go oh fuck that was the consequence which isn't permanent in this instance because it's d d and death isn't permanent you're not just putting them in timeout you're giving them a problem to which they can therefore create a solution to. I think that's that's a big one. That's a big thing with of consequence. Not not that you can necessarily undo the damage, but there you provide them a solution, a, sorry, a new problem and they provide you a solution. It doesn't just end. It's not a, a It's not a a a a closed like a closed-ended question. Right, it intrinsically has to be open ended because it has to continue something. You I think. Know? I think. Uh, I think I can simplify this way down. TLDR, which we were getting at. Uh, Go for it. It has to be a devil's bargain. Is is really all this comes down to, and uh, what I mean by that is not just because Asmodeus is a devil. Um, devil's bargain meaning. And the, the person who posted this they already is 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 thinking about this because they mentioned that the player is going to get some perks, right? So it has to be. Player, you are being offered a bonus, a power, you know, something beneficial at the cost of something else, right? That is the consequence. It, it's going to cost you something. If you're coming at it from a narrative standpoint, then it could be something like. You can call upon Asmodeus to assist you in situations or, you know, take over or or hook you up with some sweet shit. Like maybe you need to get into the castle and you're like, Asmodeus, can you like make us fake IDs to get in? He's like, yeah, I got you, fam. But then the 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 bargain part, the bad part is that uh, Asmodeus is like, hey, I'm going to need you to kill 36 babies tomorrow. So uh, and you're like, what? Why? And you're like, well, I gave you those invites to the castle. So uh, come on, dead babies. Let's go. Right. That's the that 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 could be how you could do it narratively. If you want to do it mechanically, you could just do, you know, the paladin player. I would like to activate Asmodeus's blade of death. And you go, cool, cool, cool. Your charisma and strength are 20 fucking 25 for the rest of the day. Uh, once you long rest five levels of exhaustion the next day. Good luck. Right. Like that's the mechanical way you could go about it. But the point is, is that you get a good thing, but it's a devil's bargain. So you get a bad thing. If you remember, as in Blades in the Dark, the way the devil's bargain mechanic worked was GM. Can I have a bonus die? GM says you can get that bonus die, but something else is going to happen. That's bad. Right. So, for example, uh, I'm trying I'm running from the, you know, from the cops, the blue coats. 
I'm trying to, uh, I'm going to just turn to the nearest building and bust my way in. Can I get a bonus die? And the GM says, yes, you can get a bonus die. But if you take this devil's bargain, the house is not empty. There's going to be someone in there when you bust in. Right. That's the devil's bargain situation. It's really just got to operate around that crux. And then as as an additional point to that, the devil's bargain has to be there because you know, also the devil's bargains is the fun bit, right? Having the magical curse, you know, having the magic curse sword isn't that fun if the magic curse sword isn't super powerful, right? The curse sword is only fun because it's really powerful, right? In Critical Role, Grog picked up fucking, uh, what's his name? Vampire Man sword. The hell was his name? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Briarwood. Briarwood. Silas. Silas, yeah. Yeah. He picks up Silas Briarwood's sword and uses it because it's a really good great sword but also the whole time he's using the sword the sword's like i just want incredible violence kill everything you see or i'm gonna take your soul and grog's like oh shit that's crazy (laughs) right it's only cool to have the cursed weapon if you get a cool power for it so that's that's that whole devil's bargain idea and then the other thing is the bargain has to be the player's choice right so you said oh the player character's a manchurian candidate don't just force it on them willy nilly, right? Don't just be like, oh, you hear the rustle of the leaves. You now have the incredible urge to mur- murder the mayor. Don't do that. Say, you know, you make it a situation where the, the player has the option to sort of invoke the bargain, right? So let's go with the cursed sword situation. The, the Victoro Castellanter's like, I need you to go deal with this person. And you're like, uh, all right, fine, I'll go kill him. They bring their cursed sword. They they could draw their cursed sword and kill the person with it, in which case they'll get a sick bonus for using the cursed sword. Or they could just kill them with a the regular sword and not tap into the evil power shit, right? Because they like they don't want to in that moment. It has to be up to them because if you just force it on them, Either A, the player's not going to deal with it. Like, you're going to choose to deal with it at some point, and they're not going to want to, or vice versa. They're going to want to deal with it, and you're not going to want to deal with it. So you want to try and leave it in their hands to invoke it, because that's how they'll feel more invested in the whole situation. If they have a modicum of control over when it, like, really starts to come up. This is a similar thing to like burning wheel has the flaws mechanic where you can get bonus dice if you invoke your character's flaw, but you could just ignore your flaw if you really just don't want to deal with it in the moment. But if you do it, you get a carrot, you know, it carrot in the stick, right? You're, you're being offered a carrot. So Hmm. that's the more TLDR version, which is pretty much you were saying condensed down a little. You have to yeah, do that, much, yeah. that devil's bargain back and forth. Yes. That's, and that's the I meat mean, and potatoes. The the slight thing after that as well is, is the devil's bargain does not just begin at the initial contract, right? Yeah, it could be the whole way. What, yeah, what I was saying towards through. the end is that, yeah, the, the thing that I was really trying to key in at the end is a consequence with no recourse is a punishment. Is just a shitty punishment, yeah. The the fact that it can and will lead to something else is what makes it a consequence. It makes it feel like something that is intrinsic to the story and not just you taking shit away, which no one wants. Yes, yes. Just taking shit away and then giving nothing in return or not doing... Like, just taking stuff away just because for no particular reason defeats the point <laughs> that's yeah it's, that's about it fun idea though I do love the idea of player getting a contract with Asmodeus and getting some sick devil powers or whatever okay yeah, dude that's all very, very into that um I suppose we should wrap it there huh yeah yeah, we went a lot farther than I expected. We have two left, so we might do a quick little part two or something, but. Discussion for another time. Yeah, discussion for that. We'll cut it for now. 
that was a good non-aggressive one to to end on, and also one that you know had some manageable grammar. <laughs> Oh my god! I that, yeah. I want you to know how many times I had to reread that one. Just be that like, was what? That was a that was a struggle. I was I was on the struggle bus for that. Like I figured it out. Yeah. God damn. God damn. Yeah. This this. Anyway, proofread people. Proofread your fucking posts online, please. God, Jesus, the amount of times that this happens. I know people, but I can hope. I can dream. Yeah, but it it won't change. I know. I could I could try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, follow us on Twitter, motherfuckers. Yeah. Before the muskrat implodes, it encroaches for closer every day. It seems. Yeah, me thinks we should make a blue sky just in case. Ah, uh, you know, it's 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 on the to do list. Yeah, it's on the to do. list. Anyway, though, bye bye. You know, it's fine. Yeah, we're not a we're He's, not we're not about politics, so we won't go down. Very true. Uh. <laughs> Goodness. All right. Bye,